Hey, welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're glad you're tuning into this episode. Uh, we are a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we really appreciate you listening, watching on YouTube. We really encourage you to subscribe to whatever platform you're using. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, or if you're on Apple or however you listen to a podcast, be sure and subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. Also, make comments if you like it and share it if you like it. We really need people to make comments and share the episodes that you like. And then also, if you're not already a supporter, we really would encourage you to go to spiritualityadventures.com and you can pick a tier and we have bonus content for every type of giver. These are this is a nonprofit, so they're tax deductible donations, but we do provide bonus content for those who uh, are supporters. So be a part of the team, help support Spirituality Adventures. And we're so glad you're tuning into this episode. All right, welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for tuning into this episode. I am so excited to introduce you to Sammy Awad. If you guys uh, haven't ever heard of Sammy, we're going to talk about his his story, his family, his history. He is right now in Bethlehem in the West Bank, and he is from a Christian Palestinian family. Uh, historically, their family uh, dates way, way back. <laughs> We're going to talk about yeah. that. And uh, yeah, so um, I thank you, Sammy, for joining us at Spirituality Adventures. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a while. We I think we would have met somewhere around 2008 through Carl Medeiros at the Middle East suite at the national prayer breakfast. Yeah. And then uh, you kind of got, can, you spoke at a vineyard conference one time. I remember I had you in at my church, um, your, your, your whole family. So tell, tell people your connection to Kansas city, because I still have a big Kansas city crowd that listens. So, yeah. 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 That's good. So, so my connection to Kansas City is uh, is I was born uh, in Kansas City. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1971. Uh, my father and my mother are both Palestinians, and my father was working in an inner city school in Kansas City uh, when I was born. Uh, and then during that time, uh, being from the Middle East, uh, he was the first person to travel from Palestine to, to the U.S., ended up in Kansas City. So he pulled a lot of family into the Kansas City area. And then he decided to come back here. So when I was six months old, uh, we moved back uh, to Bethlehem and then family stayed in Kansas City where it became kind of the hub uh, for our family. Uh, uncles, aunts, and then of course cousins. And then my brother ended up there. I ended up going to college uh, there as well to KU, Jayhawk fan, uh, and graduated from KU. And yeah, just love Kansas City, love the Chiefs. Uh, one thing that I do every season, even though the time difference is so big, I make sure to watch every Kansas City game that I can. So usually at two or three or four in the morning, I'm up watching the Chiefs uh, beat somebody usually. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's been crazy. Like, because there's so many games, you know, where the chiefs, you're just like going, they're going to lose, they're going to lose. And then, then they pull it out. You know, it's just like, it's, it's just craziest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, they need to do it for one more year. Keep doing it. Yeah. yeah. Three P three P. <laughs> That's what we want. Yeah. Now the training camp is, you know, up in St. Joe, which is about 40 minute drive from where I'm sitting right now. And uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, Brian Zahn is up there in St. Joe. I bet you met Brian once or twice. Oh, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So Sammy, let's, let's first talk about your, you know, your family history and background in Palestine. Cause still, you know, you know, this Sammy, there's still Americans that would be listening to this podcast who, ha who don't understand when Israel became a nation, <laughs> what happened to the people that were already living there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so give us, just kind of give us your, your family history as it relates to the, the, the nation of Israel. And, and then, and then we'll start diving into, you know, the, the current, you know, the situation that has been created over the last 50 plus years, plus, you know, how it just continues to, get crazy, crazier, crazier. So, yeah. 
Yeah. So I'll start by saying that as a family, as a Christian family in this land, we go on record at least 800 years back. This is the church records. This is when they started registering people in the church uh, census and the church records. So who knows even how far before that. And and we could go back even to the time of Christ. So we could be, you know, our family or people who come, our ancestors could be some of the first people who believed in Christ during Pentecost uh, or during the time of his, his living here. And then so th this is a family, like many families, that has always existed here. And like many families in this land, these families also converted between different religions and different faiths. I actually did a DNA test, and a majority of my DNA blood is actually Jewish blood, <laughs> which is not surprising, uh, because these are the people that stayed here. The indigenous people that stayed in this land are the ones who have the indigenous blood here, uh, not like many people who came from Eastern Europe or from other countries who actually don't have any gen genetic or DNA connection uh, to this land. Uh, but I'm not going to give you the 800-year history of the family. I don't know if we have enough time for that. Uh, I'll, I'll jump to 1948, which was yeah. the pivotal uh, turning point. And, and one thing that is also very, very important for the audience to understand that unlike what many people like to claim because it justifies their use of violence towards others, this is not a historic, intractable, long-lived thousand, two thousand year conflict going back even to the time of uh, the sons of Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. This is not spiritual warfare uh, between the forces of good and evil, between the forces of those who believe and don't. Uh, that is all a lies and lies that have been told to have people buy into choosing one side or the other. Of course, if you are told this is a spiritual conflict, you're going to choose whatever is the right side versus the wrong side. And if I'm telling you this is a spiritual conflict and I'm on the right side and they're on the wrong side, you're going to listen uh, to me. This this land has experienced many conflicts historically, not more or less than any other country in the world. And it has also witnessed many moments of peace between the different religious and tribes of this land. Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived in this land in uh, in beautiful relationships, connection, peaceful coexistence, supporting each other, uh, engaging socially with each, each other for many, many years. Uh, and so this is definitely not a religious conflict as some people like to claim it. This is a conflict where a group uh, for many reasons uh, decided to colonialize this piece of land, claiming, of course, some historical connection to this land, which we as Palestinians don't deny Jewish history in this land, but claiming it as an exclusive right, which is not even biblical <laughs> to say that, and decided to take over this land and to ethnically cleanse as many of the non-Jews as possible from this land. Uh, my, my father uh, grew up I was born and grew up in a neighborhood in Jerusalem, again, where Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived next to each other as really good neighbors with each other. There was no issue. There was no tension uh, between them. But when an ideology, which we call Zionism, came into play, that changed the reality of, of life here. And that's when the conflict uh, began to happen. When the Jewish uh, forces or the Zionist forces came and took over that neighborhood, my grandfather was killed uh, during that time. He was shot by them as a civilian. He wasn't involved in combat. And all the non-Jews were ordered to evict uh, their homes uh, and leave their homes, including yeah. Christians, so Christians and Muslims. And the Jewish families at that time defended the right of their neighbors to stay there. They had absolutely no problem with them. They insisted that they should stay there, but they couldn't do anything about it. And so we became refugees. This is the refugee crisis that many people know and heard about in 1948, where close to 75% of the population uh, became uh, refugees, uh, Christians and Muslims. It didn't matter. As yeah. long as you were not a Jew, you had to leave. Yeah, and give just again, because there's just so many people that I bump into that just don't understand this, this history. Prior to 1948, there had not been a Jewish state for how long? Uh, I mean, if we talk about the, the state of, you know, the, the, the nation Israel. of David and Solomon, yeah, the, right. uh, that's like, uh, what, whatever, 2,500 years before that. Right. Uh, 
And again, uh, yeah. even so, in that state, even in that nation, there wasn't, again, this exclusivity, this uniqueness over the land of one people over over others. Yeah. Uh, it was a tribe like many tribes. And, and that history was actually, it was one of the smallest reigns of a nation in this land compared to the Ottomans, compared to the Crusades, compared to the Islamic rules. It wasn't as long lived as, as these nations. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, if we want to go back historically and just do claims, yeah. everybody has a claim to this right. land. Right. Everybody has at least the same claim to this land. Yeah. And so then after World War II, the UN basically, I think out of what, all kinds of motivations, right? But they basically decide to yeah. create a state for Israel on this historic land. Well, and the, the main yeah. incident that happened before, it, it was actually before the end of the First World War, where the British, uh, as uh, promised the, the Zionist organization, which is the, the, the group that was leading the Zionists in Europe, uh, through their foreign secretary, Balfour, which is the Balfour Declaration, right. promised the Jews a homeland in Palestine if they win the war. The, this was an alliance that they needed for the war itself. And so, as we know, in political alliances, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. And the promise was made, even though the British had no control. So the British promised something that they didn't own to a people that that thing didn't belong to. Uh, the British won the war and they had to commit to their promise. At the same time, they were promising the Palestinians a state in the state of Palestine once the Ottomans uh, were defeated. And so the British promised two people uh, land to build their, their state on. And, and so during the years between the First and the Second World War, a tremendous influx of Jews, especially from Eastern Europe, started coming into the land mainly as a result of anti-Semitism and uh, violence towards Jews in these areas in, in Europe, in Eastern and Western Europe. That's when Jews were escaping uh, the rise of Nazism uh, leading up to the Holocaust. And again, I hope many listeners know that it was the United States who actually rejected many Jews from entering the United States during that time and sent them back to the concentration camps, sent them back uh, to Europe uh, to get burned. It was Palestinians who actually welcomed. My great grandfather welcomed Jews in his home when they were escaping from Eastern Europe. But that shifted very quickly to seeking refuge, to turning the tide over and becoming the power dynamic and then wanting to rule and take over. And certain elements of, of extremism within that Jewish group took charge. And this is when the ethnic cleansing began to happen. And of course, as you said, during the Second World War, as a result of the exposure of what the Holocaust did to the Jews during that time, there was also a lot of guilt, a lot of shame within these European countries that they decided that, uh, yeah, we will support the establishment and we'll recognize the establishment of the state because that's, that's how we can make amends for the disaster that we created uh, towards them. Yeah, so you make amends in one space and create another one in another space, right? So, exactly. and and just to put a head on it, the, you had family land that go, went way back in Israel. What it what is it now? Modern day Israel, and you were basically just moved out of your property. It was taken from you, yeah. and you put into a refugee camp. Your family. Yeah, we, we lost the land, we lost the property, we lost everything we had. My grandmother had seven children, the oldest was 12, and the youngest was two. And the only thing that she left with was a bag full of clothes and the key to the house. Now, we were lucky because we, we could have, we almost ended in a refugee camp, but ended up being with family members in Bethlehem. If you had family, that's where you went to. Uh, but we're considered refugees. Many people ended up in refugee camps, either in the West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, or Lebanon mostly. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, I've toured, I've been in the West Bank, and I've been in a couple of the other refugee camps, Palestinian refugee camps, one on the Lebanon border, one on, I think one on the Syrian border too. Is that right? Yeah. How, many, how many Palestinian refugee camps are there in and around Israel base that started back when your family lost its land. 
Well, I mean, there are tens of refugee camps uh, all over. In the West Bank um, alone, I think there are maybe 18, 19 refugee camps. In Gaza, there are seven, eight refugee camps. In Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, it's, it's quite quite a lot of refugee camps. That were all there. dating back to 1948, basically, right? 1948. And then another wave of refugees uh, was created in 1967. Uh, where more refugees were created as a, as a result of that war uh, and had to uh, yeah, ended up in, in refugee camps as well. And the people that live in these refugee camps basically have no international citizenship as, or status as citizens any, of any cons- Is that true? How does, how, how, yeah. how does the world view these the people that have been living and having families in these refugee camps all these decades. So, so it depends on what camps you live in. Uh, if you're in Jordan, you have a better status, for example, than in Lebanon. If you're in the West Bank, you have a little bit better status than in Jordan, for example. And so each country decided what is the status that they wanted to give the refugees. So in Jordan, they actually made the refugees become residents of, of Jordan. They, they have citizenship, they have passports. It's a different passport than what the Jordanian uh, original people have, but but they are as Jordanian citizens because it's a very big part of the Jordanian population. Uh, about 70, 65, 70 percent of Jordanians are Palestinians. So they, they have the same rights as the Jordanians uh, that live there. In Lebanon, which was one of the worst places, is they have absolutely no status. Uh, the documents and that's they have the one I went documents. through. I think That's, with uh, Samir Kurdi, uh, uh, John, was it, what was the name of the guy that worked with Samir in that refugee camp? Um, is there a guy named Jonathan or anyway, I can't, I'm blanking now. So, so these, uh, these refugees are registered in, under the United Nations uh, uh, relief works organizations. Uh, so UNRWA is the one that takes care of these, they register birth, they register death. And then their documents are United Nations issued uh, documents, which is very difficult for them to travel, very difficult for them to move. Uh, it's very, very difficult for them to get jobs even uh, in Lebanon. So they live very, very difficult uh, situations. In the West Bank, uh, le- the refugees and the Palestinians who exist in the West Bank are treated the same by the Israelis. So our uh, they don't differentiate between refugees or not. With, within our own system, we differentiate just to say that these are registered also under the United Nations, like our family, or are not. Uh, but under occupation, we were all given the same ID card, for example, the same status as being just Palestinians living under the military rule of uh, Israel. Yeah, so then the try to bring us to the to the 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 situation that you've grown up in at the West bank, because there's still, you know, give a quick overview of like, how has West bank, all the people that live in the West bank, the the checkpoints, you know, the, the, I'm assuming the territories, ABC, you know, and then the, and then the people, the Jewish people who are trying to set the settlers, the whole scene and, give a little feel for West bank and what it's like there. And then com- compare and contrast that to Gaza, because obviously we're going to dive into the Gaza situation here in just a minute, but I just kind of wanted to lay some historic backdrop for your family and for the whole Palestinian issue that's going on, especially for people who, you know, they hear bits and pieces and they just don't understand the full picture, you know? Yeah. So as, as many people also would remember, there was, there, we talked about the 1948 war. There was the 1967 war that Israel won. Uh, they won both wars. And in 1967, they took over the last remaining territories that were that were part of the map of, of Palestine uh, during the British mandate. But from 1948 to 1967, were not controlled by Israel. It was the Jordanians, the Syrians, and the Golan Heights, and the Egyptians controlling uh, Egypt. Uh, once they took it over, they they took over the whole thing. That means they had power and they had rule over the land. And one thing I always say is that Israel, after they won the war, 
could have easily and there was actually a discussion to say we're going to take this whole land we're going to annex it we're going to make it all part of the state of israel and we're going to make all the people in this land become israeli citizens we could even make them second class citizens where they don't have voting rights but they refuse to do that israel imposed its military and since 1967 we have been living under direct israeli military rules and command until this point, even with the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, that authority still lives under the Israeli military rule. And so military rule is military rule. That means you have no rights, uh, no civil rights, no human rights. Uh, they're denied. Uh, no treatment uh, of being equal. Definitely no voting rights. No access to resources, uh, no ability to build and to expand without the military deciding if you could or couldn't. And so it was quite a harsh and brutal reality that Palestinians have been living in. And this is the West Bank and Gaza. Both, both we lived under the same uh, conditions. Much more difficult always in Gaza because Gaza is a much more condensed area, much more smaller area and a very high population. And so when it comes to poverty, it's it's a much uh, more difficult situation in Gaza. Uh, but it was it was all the same until uh, as until 93, when there was a peace process called the Oslo peace process, where the Palestinians were given, as I said, the Palestinian authority, which was more of a sense of uh, rule over your own people. We still control everything as Israel, but we give you the ability to rule over your own population. You have authority over the Palestinian population and what you mentioned, which is Area A, which is about 15% of the total territory of the West Bank and Gaza. And so since 93, Palestinians have had a sense of self-rule only on a small segment of the area that was promised to be the Palestinian state in the negotiations. And that was at least an area that was contested under international law, because Israel, again, never annexed this land and made it part uh, of the state of Israel. And so we have, as Palestinians, been living under this since 1967, uh, this brutal military rule and occupation uh, where people really have no rights and, and right to protest, right to self-determination, right to voice your opinion, right to say no to the occupation is is responded with a brutal force uh, by the army itself. And for Americans, like if we go back to the Jim Crow laws of the South, you know, where, you know, blacks couldn't vote in America, you know, separate drinking fountains, all this kind of stuff, but still they could, there was still a, a different feel to Jim Crow South America than what you're talking about, because you I've been I've been through the checkpoints with you. <laughs> I mean, there is you feel I mean, I've walked through the checkpoints where there's teenagers with machine guns, Israeli mm -hmm. teenagers with machine guns treating Palestinians like shit in the West Bank, in their homeland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different a, feel it's, uh, than even Jim Crow South, don't you think? Term. It's a continuous process of demonizing and dehumanizing of an entire population. It is a process where every Palestinian is seen and perceived as guilty in a way. And, and there is no way to prove innocence. Just by being Palestinian, you are seen as an enemy. Uh, I'll say this even for me, as a Palestinian who's committed to peace, who's committed to nonviolence, who's never touched a gun in his life and probably never will, who will never endorse even the use of violence, I've had Israeli leaders, politicians, people in the army tell me, you are seen like everybody else because we believe, and this is the, you know, the, the skewed mindset, if you have a chance, you will do something to us. That's 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 the level of of insanity I think that's spread within the Israeli society, that every Palestinian is a potential threat, and and this is something that I witnessed actually firsthand, when because and, and we could talk about this more later when when I embarked on this wish to understand this Israeli Jewish mindset, what what makes my enemy my enemy to understand how to deal with my enemy. It's not just about resisting them, fighting them, or negotiating. What is behind it? What is, what right. is behind What's that What's the issue? trauma? What's the trauma deep down? 
what is the trauma? And yeah, then collective and trauma, I, as you, yeah, yeah. I, I ended up in Auschwitz. I ended up uh, on a retreat called the Bearing Witness Retreat in the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergenau, and I was there twice. That's it. I told a couple of my Jewish rabbi friends this story, Sammy, recently of you going going and doing this, and they were both like, "I want to meet this guy." Because they they're so used to Palestinian Holocaust deniers, right? They, that's a part of their fear in that's embedded in them, right? So well, you could tell that most Palestinians, <laughs> the great majority, are not Holocaust deniers. I know, because, but it's because a part Palestinian, of the problem. Palestinians use the argument of they're doing to us what happened to them, which I don't believe in because the Holocaust has a, a whole level of tragedy uh, on its own uh, level, yeah. uh, but we acknowledge what happened to them. Or, yeah. or we are the victims of the most victimized people. So we acknowledge their victimization. This is what most Palestinians will say. Yeah. But most Palestinians, like most people in the world, don't connect to the Holocaust. It's not our story. Right. Most Americans don't connect to the Holocaust. It's not their story. Our story is what happened to us as a people. We don't deny it. But for me, I began to understand that we need to understand it as Palestinians. We need to deeply understand the Holocaust because what I heard in Auschwitz and Bergenau is uh, is Israeli teachers telling Israeli teenagers, kids 13, 14 years old, uh, that the Holocaust is not over, that this is our history, this is our future. Everybody hates us. Nobody respects us as Jews. Uh, and if the Palestinians have an opportunity, they'll do to you, pointing to these kids, what the Nazis did to your ancestors. This, this is something that children in Israel learn from a young age. You can never trust Palestinians. You can never make peace with Palestinians because if we give them an inch of power, they're going to use it to commit the Holocaust against us, which is completely false. But that's the way to maintain fear. And if you maintain fear, you maintain power. And this is, this is how they are able to maintain power over their own population, not just us, by continuously indoctrinate them into fear of the other, fear of the other. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the and this is this is a key of uh, i think of what's happening in this land that this whole conquest of israelis and 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 power game of the israelis is completely embedded in in trauma and fear that is being manipulated and abused by the establishment uh, itself and that's what they do all over the world. They go to and tell Jews, everybody hates you. You need to come to Israel. Israel is the only safe haven. Anti-Semitism everywhere. It's not about denying anti-Semitism. But if if I, as a people's group, was facing some form of discrimination and justice, my solution wouldn't be to go and isolate myself from the world and say, this is how I protect myself. If I'm facing an issue, for example, as a Palestinian in the United States where there's anti-Palestinian sentiment, it's not about me coming to Palestine. It's about me believing that there is a system in the United States of checks and balances, of respect for civil and human rights, a legal system that makes people accountable, that I have to fix my anti-Palestinian problem in the United States, not to leave so that anti-Palestinian sentiment stays in the United States. I have to heal I deal with anti-Palestinian sentiment. But again, this, this mindset was that no, anti-Semitism will always be there. It will never end. And the only way to deal with it is by creating a homeland for us. Mm. That, that defeats even the purpose for healing. There is no healing when you do that. Mm. Um, give one more piece uh, before we dive into the current situation. Um, I think it's interesting that, you know, when I met with your family in Bethlehem, just give a, there's what one point less than 2% of Palestinians are Christian. Is that right? Yeah. So I think it's less than 1% now. Less than 1%. Your family at some point, was it your, was it your dad? Was it who started Bethlehem Bible college in Bethlehem? Yeah, my father. Bashara. Yeah. My father. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, when, when did he start that? So your family basically grows up in the West bank in, in Bethlehem and, um, has been living under this Israeli occupation, you know, for over what, 70 years or something like this. Yeah. And talk a little bit about the dynamics of being Christian in West bank and yeah. leading the big, the big Bible. <laughs> yeah. 
So my father started the Bible college in 81, in 1981, uh, when he started the Bible college. And it was to serve the local Palestinian Christian community uh, so that uh, leaders can emerge within that community to, to serve the, the people, the population, both Christian and Muslim alike. Many Palestinians who wanted to study theology at that time, Christians, had no place to study it in the land. They had to go to Germany, to England, to the United States, to seminaries, and universities there and many of them uh, stayed wherever they ended up they didn't come back they found somebody they loved they got married you know they, they lived their life and so my father said why why are we exporting our christian leaders overseas to study the bible in the land of the bible <laughs> from mm -hmm. the land of the bible and so that's when he started the bible college and it's become a very big institute to serve again all the local community and then, then one thing, again, that, that narrative of the us and them that the Western world tries to always spread, because the Western world is completely embedded in polarities and dualism. It's either this or that, uh, this or that. It's either Christian or Muslim, Judeo-Christian or Muslim. It's Arab or, or that, and trying to spread, again, uh, lies that show that the Christian Palestinians are being persecuted by the Muslim uh, Palestinians. And this is why Christians are, are leaving the land. Uh, and this is not true. Uh, I, and I cannot re remember a story of anybody in my family being attacked or persecuted or being hurt because they are a Christian. They may have done something really bad and they get, you know, <laughs> Uh, reprimanded for it, but it's not because they're a Christian. Uh, again, like anywhere else in the world, imagine, well, I mean, you have it everywhere now in the, in, in the world where somebody who gets pulled over by a speed ticket and he's of some ethnic group and the person who pulls him of some other ethnic group, immediately we jump to the conclusion that this is why they pulled him over, not because they were speeding. Well, no, I mean, if you, uh, this is how we live here. Actually, the reality we live here is much better than many places in the world where, yes, if I get pulled over by a Muslim police officer, it's because I have a speeding ticket, not because I'm a Christian or he sees a cross hanging uh, from my mirror or there's a, the fish on the back sticker on the back of my trunk. This doesn't exist here. Uh, both Christians and Muslims have suffered tremendously under this Israeli military occupation. And the Israeli occupation, as I said before, does not differentiate between us. There is no better treatment of Christians because they're Christians in the land. Even when they do that, it backfires on them. When they try to give us more permits, for example, than the Muslims to try to create this shift, uh, rift between us, it doesn't, it doesn't work. This doesn't say that there isn't violence in society. There aren't issues that happen in society. They happen. And sometimes they, they escalate to become Christian Muslim because, uh, because when, when law and order breaks down in any society, you go to your tribe to protect you. And so there are more challenges in the Palestinian society, for example, between people who live in the refugee camps and people who live in the city, between the rich and the poor, between this tribe and this tribe. And this is all within the Muslim community. There are more challenges between being a Catholic and an Orthodox as a Christian or being uh, a Pentecostal evangelical and being an Armenian here than between Christians and Muslims. And so we fall back into our tribalism for protection. But it's not our starting point to be to look at the other from a place of tribalism mm -hmm. share uh give a, a another quick thing your your family has been working with not basically nonviolent, taking a page out of gandhi or martin luther king jr nonviolent civil rights uh protests you've been put in jail mubarak your uncle has been called the Gandhi of the West Bank. Give give us just a little feel for that work that's been going on uh, yeah. for you and your family for for your whole life. I mean, you just you start doing this when you're a teenager. No, uh, I was 12 years old when 12 I 12 years old. <laughs> my first. So it was before I was a teenager. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, it's. Uh, mm, and all all honor is given to my grandmother in this uh after her husband was killed in 1948 and she buried him in the courtyard of the house she insisted and she was a woman of faith that uh as a christian family because i think she understood jesus 
better than 99% of Christians today understand Jesus, sadly to say this, that we will never seek revenge and retaliation for what happened to us because Jesus never fought revenge and retaliation for what happened to them. He, he, to him, he was on the cross and he said, forgive them for what they do. And she took this to her heart. This is what Jesus teaches us. So we need to forgive them for what they did to us. We will never take revenge and retaliate against them for what they did. At the same time, Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. So it's not about ignoring. It's not about running away. It's about actively engaging and making peace with those who you have forgiven and want to build a better relationship with. This is how she would define justice even. Justice is the process of seeking peace and reconciliation with those who have harmed you. It's not revenge, not retaliation, not making them pay for what they did, not getting back what I lost even from them. And then that was the seed that she planted in her children and us as grandchildren. And I could tell you at least one of my daughters is moving in that direction as a great, great grandchild uh, of uh, this amazing uh, woman who taught us this. And, and at the same time, we believe that nonviolence is the more right, strategically, and more powerful option to achieve the goals that we need to achieve as Palestinians. Violence has never gotten us anything. And, and when, every time we see violence, it gives an excuse and a justification for the Israeli system to engage in fierce amounts of violence and collective punishment towards Palestinians. What's happening in Gaza is at a high level of intensity, but it's important to say it is not new. Collective punishment for acts of violence by Palestinians, acts of resistance by Palestinians, armed resistance, whatever we want to call it, have always been responded to with collective punishment of the family, of the community, of the area that this person uh, would have come from. And, and so we, we are aware uh, of this. This, uh, this has been our experience. So this is why we say nonviolence is always a better option because it, at one point it also tries to put an end to the cycle of violence. When you're engaging in nonviolence, it doesn't mean that the other side engages in nonviolence. They will probably respond to violence, as you said. We've been arrested, we've been detained, we've been beaten up. An uncle of mine has been deported, violently deported because of his engagement in nonviolence. But at a certain point of time, a tipping point, a turning point happens where that society begins to realize we cannot continue to act in violence towards these people who are nonviolent towards us. Why are we doing this? The, the, the collective consciousness of a community arises. This is what happened in the United States. This is what happened in India. We cannot justify the use of violence anymore because they are not being violent towards us. How can we justify it other than us just being violent murderers? And this is not what we want to be. So the excuse that we're just defending ourselves has no bearing when it comes to acts of nonviolent resistance. Mm -hmm. I, I thoroughly uh, have come to love your family and admire. Oh man, I, I don't even have words for it all, but uh, yeah. Um, Gaza, I, you know, I had, uh, Hanum Assad came to Kansas city over a decade ago. Uh, mm -hmm. do you know? Her? Yeah. Yeah. He's a student of the Bible college. He graduated from the Bible college. Yeah. And started, or I don't know, there was a church in Gaza city. I think that he pastored it was Gaza city Baptist church. I think, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the Gaza Baptist church. Yeah. Um, so Hana has hung out with me as well here in Kansas city, Sammy. And uh, it was interesting when I had him, a couple of the Jewish rabbis from Kansas City came to listen to him talk. And uh, it was it was quite interesting, <laughs> as you can imagine. But uh, as you know so well, right, these conversations yeah. can be amazing. But yeah, so let's talk October 7th. Um, yeah, uh, let give us your perspective on what's happened since October 7th and how that's affected Gaza and West Bank and the whole environment there for now, what, nine months or so? Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying that my mother's family is from Gaza. Mm. We talked a lot about my father's family, but my mother's family is from Gaza. And, and I had family, my uncle, my aunt, my cousins, uh, cousins-in-law, they, they were all living in Gaza. Uh, that That's where she's from. That's the original home. And... Uh, yeah, when, when October 7th first happened uh, and news started coming out, of course, the first thing that we 
heard and saw in Bethlehem were bombs, the rockets and missiles that were coming from Gaza towards Israel. And so we didn't know what was really happening. Was it just an attack of missiles from Gaza towards Israel? And then we started hearing news that there was uh, people that have gone into Israel also from Gaza, and there was invasion, and uh, there was uh, military attacks. So it was quite quite confusing, October 7th, trying to get the news of what happened. Uh, everything was in absolute uh, chaos. But I remember my first thought was that if this is what's happening in Gaza, Gaza is going to be destroyed. Mm. There is no way Israel will ever allow this to go without destroying Gaza. This mm. was my first reaction. And the first thing I did was pick up a phone, called my cousin in Gaza and said, find a way to get out. If what is happening really is what we're hearing, this is not going to be good. You need to leave Gaza now. Of course, there's no way for them to leave Gaza. Uh, they, they got stuck uh, in Gaza. We were able to get them out just a couple of months ago, actually. Oh, wow. They had to evict their home and, and ended up in uh, sort of these makeshift refugee camps, three of them, before they, we were able to get them out and pay a lot of money to the border uh, to get them into into Cairo. Uh yeah, so October's as again, I'll start from the point in saying violence does not help anything, anybody. And for me, I am in absolutely no way a fan of Hamas and the militarism of Hamas or the ideology of Hamas. Uh, but uh, as a Palestinian, I say this is something that exists within my own community. And this is stuff that we have to deal with as Palestinians, uh, just like you have your fringe groups in the United States. You don't like imagine, you know, the French coming in and saying, we're going to get rid of the KKK in uh, wherever, in Mississippi. And, and you as Americans have nothing to do with it because they hurt some of us or something like that. Uh, we, again, by the rejection of violence, I we understand. And I said before, the collective punishment is a, a tool that Israel uses, even though it violates every tenant of international law. Israel started without even allowing the dust to settle without even allowing for many Israeli Jewish families time to grieve and to reconnect and to really take in what was happening. Israel started this all out bombardment of Gaza left and right. It was it was as a response. It, it wasn't in any way strategic. It wasn't targeting Hamas. It was we are going to make the whole population of Gaza pay the price of what this group called Hamas did to us. Because for the first time, I would say, in the history of Israel, Israel was insulted uh, for the lies that it had established that we are a safe haven for the Jews. We protect the Jews. We have controlled the Palestinians. Yes, when they shoot every once in a while, it's okay because we make them pay for it. But this was a shock to the system uh, of Israel itself, what happened. And, and the response was a shocking response as well. It's like, you know, like the bully in the school who for the first time gets hit real hard by the person that he's bullying. The bully is not going to cry. The bully is going to become even more violent to the point where he might even, you know, do, do more harm to that kid than what he, what he would have just by bullying him. And, and this was the response. It was a response of a bully that for the first time was insulted for being a bully. And again, like for me, it's a tragedy of what happened on October 7th. There is absolutely no denial uh, of that. Mm -hmm. I have Israeli About 1200. friends lost relatives uh, in, in these places, dear, dear friends of mine who lost their uh, their nephews and nieces uh, in, in, the, in the festival, uh, the Nova yeah. festival that happened there. Yeah. And so for me, I cried with them to what happened. Yeah. But the tragedy is that, yes, that was a tragedy but every day since then, as you said, for the last nine months, it's been a tragedy at the same level of intensity that the Palestinians have been facing. And the sad reality is the world is just sitting in silent and not stopping this, and I will call it a genocide, uh, from happening uh, to the people of Gaza. Yeah, how many, how many estimated deaths are there now, the death toll in Gaza right now at nine month mark? It's the, the numbers are touching 40,000 people, but they say when, when the dust settles, it's going to be over 100,000, maybe over 150,000. 
of the bodies that are still not covered in the, in the ruins of many of these communities that have been completely, completely destroyed. I mean, it's basically like, was there a million, half, two million people in Gaza on October it's, 7th? It's, uh, it's 2.5 2. million and 1.9 million are. And basically, they, the I mean, it's basically been just shifting the whole population has been shifted around, lost their homes, been bombed. I mean, basically the whole place is living in tents now. Right. And depending on. It's the, the conditions. None of us can even imagine, even me as a Palestinian living in the West bank, I cannot imagine the day to day agony, suffering, trauma, looking for food, looking for water, looking for medicine, looking for a toilet, looking for toilet paper, looking for water to wash yourself. Imagine us like two days without any of this stuff. What will happen? You heard what happened in the United States and during COVID when the toilet paper thing became a big issue. Imagine being like this for a week, not knowing anything. Sewage water, the stench of dead bodies everywhere. Uh, again, this is something that none of us, none of us can imagine. And and what, what breaks my heart is seeing politicians use and abuse this and mock this and then stand with ideologies that are creating this, uh, inviting people like Netanyahu to come to speak to the joint session of Congress for me as an American, I'm going to say, was deeply embarrassing mm -hmm. uh, to do, to see this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, to see the U.S. in its position has been quite shameful. Uh, a country that, again, as an American that I love and I respect and see in it that it carries values of human rights, of civil rights, of respect, of each person's dignity, engage in demonizing and dehumanizing an entire population because they are not white enough, they are not Christian, they're not part of the Judeo-Christian sect. Is this a reason? Why, why we do this? It's uh, it's quite quite embarrassing uh, to me, and and I I hope this will be a wake up call for many Americans to say this is not the country that we want and want our children to grow up in a country that has prided itself on plurality of diversity of of welcoming uh, migrants into it, becoming like this, uh, led by a person like Netanyahu. This this sort of this nonsense led who is rejected by his own people <laughs> in his own state he's rejected by his people yeah. and the americans are endorsing him more than the american politicians sorry are endorsing even, him more than even my close rabbi friends here in kansas city do not like netanyahu right uh and they're um it's ah yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but what there are i've heard technical arguments about genocide but just as a person who knows you and has been in the area, you know, I'm just watching it. It it's a genocide, right? I mean, it's just crazy. Like um, the response of just wiping out an entire population, basically. Yeah. Uh, whew, oh my God. But I hear every now and then I'll hear people, trying to talk about technical arguments about what, what a genocide is and isn't. It's like, ah. Uh. So, so my, my argument to them is I, I don't argue with them. I don't talk with them. I say, are you ready to engage in something to stop what's happening, no matter what, what it is or not? Or are you justifying what's happening or not? You, you want to call whatever you want to call it. You want to call it killing. You want to call it revenge. You want to call it retaliation. You want to call it counter violence. You, you want to call it making them pay for what they did to us. Fine. Or try to eliminate Hamas is the, or try to eliminate Hamas. the most, you know, like yeah. we're just going to limit, we're going to do this until Hamas is done, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my question is if, if this means that you justify the violence that's happening, where so many innocents are dying every day because of this, then you're on the wrong side of history. If you are ready to stop it, I don't care what you call it. You need to stop it. This, this is the humane thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I mean, I am, again, I am not a supporter of Hamas at all, but this is not a way to eliminate a radical group that actually feeds on being marginalized and being attacked the way it is. Like, look at us, everybody hates us. And so this is why we need everybody to support us from mm -hmm. the community because everybody's against us. We, we, what's happening now is actually feeding Hamas more 
than not than pulling power away from Hamas. Mm. These groups use victimization to yeah. rally support around them. Yeah. And Israel knows this. Israel knows this very well. And and for me, I have to question at the end of the day, is it really about eliminating Hamas or not? Uh, or is it just, again, creating a Palestinian group of people that is just so angry of what they experience, like any of us would be so angry of what we experience, that we can always say, oh, we cannot make peace with them because they hate us. Mm. Well, <laughs> you're making people hate you. Mm. How can you even think about making peace with them we haven't given them anything in the past, only violence, only restrictions. And now how can we make peace with people who hate us? Mm -hmm. But isn't this what we're taught? Like this is who you actually make peace with? You don't yeah. make peace with the people that love you. You make peace with the people that hate you. You sit with them, you negotiate, you 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 deal with the injustice that has happened. You you make reparations for what you've done and you make peace. Everybody can make peace with everybody. We know this. It's just the forces. There are forces that actually don't want peace to happen here. Yes. Yeah. Let's let's talk a little bit about the healing of trauma because it it's a collective trauma as you as you've talked about, and it's there's a collective trauma in the history of Israelis. There's a collective trauma in the history of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, Sammy, you've you've done as much as anybody that I know personally to try to bring healing in a nonviolent way. Um, I, I have recently been studying with Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield, uh, and it comes from a Vipassana Buddhist tradition and mindfulness meditation. And I'm also with a new denomination called disciples of Christ, which we, we actually went through uh, trauma training to get my full standing with this denomination, I had to read a book called my grandmother's hand by uh, Resma. I'm going to blank on his last name, but it, it, it was a, an application of mindful meditation to the trauma between what he called blue bodies and black bodies in America, you know, blacks in America throughout their history have been uh, victims of blue body violence mm. Then, but even the blue bodies experience trauma and victimization in a reverse fashion in America as well. And it's a book that unpacks the trauma that resides in collective trauma between two groups of people who have basically been embattled with each other for, you know, over a century, you know, centuries. Yeah. Talk about some of your work, because you've been doing this kind of work for a long time uh, in meditation and in nonviolence, and you've pulled together different streams of thought. I remember at one time you even connected with Richard. Uh, weren't you doing a documentary with Richard Gere at one time? Uh, we hosted I, Richard Gere here. Yeah. Huh? We hosted you know, Richard Gere here. Yeah. Talk about some of that work that you've done because, and I've even talked to my rabbi friends here who we've, there's some groups in America where, people, Israelis are meeting with Palestinians in the context of what's going on in Gaza right now, trying to heal the collective trauma between these yeah. two bodied people, right? These embodied groups of people. Talk about some of this stuff with us. Yeah. So uh, it started out for me when I went to Auschwitz, that tour that I, the pilgrimage that I did there. Uh, and I came back and I met with my staff and I said, you know, nonviolence is important. It's key but we cannot resolve this conflict. We cannot fix this without addressing trauma, collective trauma that both communities are suffering from. And as we know, at the individual level and the collective level, if you are traumatized, if you are in fear, you, are in, you will engage in actions that are motivated from that fear and trauma that you are in. That becomes the lens that you see others. And so imagine two individuals who are traumatized from different experiences coming together they're not going to get along. <laughs> They're going to see each other as a potential threat. They're going to see each other as a potential thing to conquer, to destroy, because I don't want the trauma to be repeated in me, that violent experience to be repeated in me. And so both of our communities uh, from different experiences are deeply motivated by trauma and how we make our decisions. And people who are traumatized don't make the best decisions even for themselves, usually, most of the time. 
Uh, I would also want to say that the Palestinian trauma is a continuous uh, trauma. It, it's, it has started before 1948, 100 years before that, and continues even until this day. So even this, this moment of stepping out of the trauma, recovering, recouping, uh, recalibrating oneself has not existed for us uh, as, as Palestinians, as there was an option, I think, for Israeli Jews to do that. But as I said before, the establishment in Israel itself understood that the only way that they can control their people is through perpetuating and reinforcing the narrative of trauma within that society. And so I embarked on uh, on understanding, on researching collective trauma, how it shapes not just my identity, but how it shapes my view of the other, how I speak the language. Because the way trauma is expressed in the collective sense is in the stories that we share. It's in the narratives of how we describe what happened to me and how I treat uh, the other in the collective sense. And then I began to engage and, and I'm proud to say I have several Israeli partner organizations that we have worked with for many, many years in this field, uh, because for them, they also understand that as a Jewish society, as a Jewish community, they cannot be led and motivated and ideologized by trauma continuously in defining who they are as Jews. It's like a cancer. <laughs> if you don't heal it and deal with it, it will eat you up. And I would actually say this is a big part of what we're seeing happening in Israeli society, not just today, but even before October 7th, when Israelis were accusing their own government of becoming a fascist government. Uh, because, you know, if, if traumatized people hurt, traumatize, uh, uh, traumatize other people who also experience fascism become fascist towards others as well. And Jews who lived under fascist societies in Europe, especially the Nazis, it is very likely if there is no healing, this is what they will become. And Israeli Jews were actually making this claim about their own government, that it's become a fascist system for them again before October 7th, and now even, of course, much more. And, and so for me, in that, case, sense, in that sense, it would almost be equivalent to, you know, what a lot of my friends, uh, myself included, feel like is if we've got that threat going on in America right now, but it, it's got obviously got a different feel to it than your situation. Your situation is so much more intense and literally, you know, military occupation going on, but but still, fascism, fascism is is and don't it's like to be surprised. on the rise around the world right now, right? Um, it is. And don't be surprised in the United States when we see it rise even more and more and more. And the challenge with fascism, historically speaking, is that those who grow power in fascism do not let go of power on the ballot box. Right. They grow in power. They want to maintain and control that power. This yeah. is key. And they are ready to do this no matter what even destroying values and ethics of yeah. democracy in their own country, as we've yeah. seen in many places. I, my Ethiopian friends, when they watched January 6th, they were going, dang, can't believe America's like Ethiopia now, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. And so for me, I've been engaged on this deep research of understanding how do we engage in collective uh, trauma healing uh, work. Uh, and and we have programs that are both engaged in somatic work, some intellectual work, understanding of the self, meditation practices, Buddhist teachings is key in all of this. And also one of the things that we have engaged in more recently, which I hope your audience will accept me saying this, is also understanding uh, the medical plants, psychedelic plants, and their very strong effectiveness in healing trauma, as has been proven that uh, psychedelic uh, drugs and medicines have actually had a great effect on, on healing personal trauma, anxiety, depression, addiction, scientifically proven. And the research we're doing now is looking at this at the collective level to see if, and it's the collective level doesn't mean, you know, give magic mushrooms to everybody, which could, <laughs> could be nice. Uh, <laughs> But it means if you are able to begin to develop a different narrative, a different story of my identity than the story of victimization and the me against the other, because this is what trauma creates. And so when we do this work with Palestinians and Israelis, we've seen amazing results happen because in, in a space of healing, there is the connection to the oneness, the connection that we're all human, the connection that in our separate, even in our separate identities, 
we still come together as the human family and then to integrate that into society. So if you're able to develop leaders from both sides that are able to speak a different narrative in their own community, that allows for the healing to happen. As long as we have leaders that are only speaking a narrative of fear and separation and mistrust of the other, then the trauma will continue to perpetuate itself and increase within that society. So it's a shift in narratives that we're trying to do through the healing work uh, to say, yeah, I am who I am. I'm proud to be a Jew. I'm proud to be an Israeli. And at the same time, I fully honor and fully respect and fully to the see the full equal right of the Palestinian Muslim to live in this land as equal to me, not less than me, and the same from the other side. And so it, it brings people together in celebrating diversity in, instead of seeing diversity as a threat uh, to me. And so we've had quite success uh, in, in this work uh, with this research. I love that. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I'm, I'm, I'm diving into that world myself, Sammy. So, and, and part of it was just my own, I, my own failures and falling apart. And five years ago, I just didn't even care if I lived or died. I was so full of shame and my own failures and the trauma that it created in my world. Um, you know, I was like, I, I was, uh, I was in rehab and, uh, I got introduced to DBT therapy, di dialectical behavioral therapy, uh, Marsh Linehan. And, uh, and then the lady that started the Lilac Center here in Kansas City became a friend of mine because I started, it had a mindful meditation component to that therapy model. And that's what I pressed into. And then that's why I've gotten involved in, in, in this more deeply now, you know. And I, like I'm leading a meditation group tonight and we're doing the rain the rain meditation Beautiful. tonight, you know, <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. At, at my church, at my new church. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah, I think we need a lot of, it's a whole different topic. We need a lot of work in the churches for sure. There's a yeah. lot of for sure. for sure. For sure. Yeah. Religious trauma is very real too, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, uh, what are some of the organizations, Your name your organization and how people can find it. And then what are some of those other organizations that you mentioned that you've partnered with? Because some yeah. people really, really want to, you know, people feel hopeless. Like they don't know what to do. They don't know how to act. They, they pray. Um, you know, I have friends who are so enraged, which I understand with the Gaza thing that they, they want to see the elimination of the state of Israel, you know, and then, you know, this two state solution has been going on for so, so long. It's like people just don't know how to respond and share with some of the organizations that you, your organization, and then the ones that you're working with, because at least it gives a little bit of hope that we can heal. You know, I, I, I can't give up on that hope of nonviolent response sure. to peace and healing and, yeah, I love what you're doing. Yeah. Sure. Give us some. So the organization that I work for now is called Nonviolence International. Uh, before that, I was the founder and the director for 25 years of an organization called Holy Land Trust. Uh, but uh, just recently, I left Holy Land Trust and took on Nonviolence or, uh, International. And, and the main reason was because... Uh, the message that I've been learning and developing for many years, it felt for me also to bring it to more of an international community, not just working in the Holy Land, not just working in Palestine and Israel. Uh, and as you said, the United States is going to need this work more than any time. And then, and it's a combination of bringing nonviolent activists, collective trauma healing, and visionary leaders. And and this is something that that is important. You. You can't have activism without have leaders that are ready to move forward. You cannot move forward without addressing the trauma of the past. And so it's a combination of all of these things that we engage in, in the work that we do. Uh, on the website of Nonviolence International, which is nonviolenceinternational.net, you could also find many partner organizations uh, that uh, we are the fiscal sponsors, but also very much in partnership with them, including Holy Land Trust uh, on the website. So people can also look into these organizations as, as partner organizations. Uh, 
the work that we're doing at the level of psychedelic uh, trauma healing is an organization called Ripples uh, that is just newly founded. Uh, and uh, and so people can also look for that. If you just go Ripples, Psychedelics, Palestine, Israel, you'll find the website. I don't have it on the top of my mind. Uh, but also there are organizations uh, that are also engaging in, uh, in trauma healing within Israeli society itself uh, that you can that can be found also on, on the website of Nonviolence International that people can look into as well. Uh, but sadly, it's it's this work needs a lot of support and many more organizations need to take it on. I remember many years ago when I was talking about nonviolent resistance, many people rejected. And said no, we cannot do nonviolent resistance. And then after that, I started talking about trauma healing, and many people rejected that. Now we're seeing more organizations, more Palestinian organizations and Israeli organizations, combatants for peace, the bereaved families that are engaging and researching and collective trauma healing work. I'm, I'm actually proud to say that there's a network called OLMAP, the Alliance for Middle East Peace, which is made up of over 150 Palestinian and Israeli organizations that has now endorsed the need for collective trauma healing as a key component of peacemaking hmm. uh, uh, and so for me yes i'm i'm very happy to see that this is becoming a topic that we need to talk about and engage in if we really want to talk about peace work okay interesting i was on a uh on a uh oh a zoom meeting with some of my uh new york progressive friends <laughs> and uh we uh, we were doing a Zoom call. I can't remember on what. And it's a group of people that I've, it's kind of a new group of people that I've been networking with and building relationships with. Um, many of them former fundamental Christians or fundamental, you know, this or that, and have moved into this kind of space that you're talking about in, in a lot of ways. Um, but definitely for nonviolence. And anyway, um, on the Zoom call, it was about 25 or 30 of us. And all of a sudden, I noticed that uh, Samir from Jordan. Uh, Pedro. Samir Pedro. Petro was on the thing. And I'm yes. like, I hadn't seen him in a, wow. almost a decade, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I literally think I was in Jordan. Do you remember when that guy had that horrible crash on that trip? Oh, One of those oh, trips yeah, that we yeah. did? Uh, from Lebanon. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, dude yeah, that worked yeah. with Samir Kurdi. Yeah, yeah. I think that was the last time I was with Samir Petro in Jordan when yeah. that crash happened. And yeah, yeah. Samir was right behind him. And, you know, anyway, so then we ended up having a separate. I was like, right. so, so we ended up having a separate call because remember, he's still connected to the Vineyard Church in Austin to some degree or another. I don't know. Anyway, it was just like yeah. it was one of those small world things. And you, do you still you still know him, right? Or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, we check in on each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I need Very to get good. back over there again. Yalla, come. I need. I, I have. A, I have a hookah ready for you to smoke when you get. I here. know. It's my my favorite thing to do with you is have some tea and hookah. Yeah. All right. Well, Sammy, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Uh, you know, you've been an inspiration to me, and um, yeah, I would. Uh, have you traveled any at all in the last year or two? Have you gotten out of the West Bank at all? Uh, it's been a year since I've been able to travel. And a big reason is because one of the things I'm also doing now is being the care provider for my parents. Uh, my father has dementia. My mother has MS. And so I'm the only one here taking care of them, which is an honor at the same time. Uh, but it limits my ability to to travel places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mubarak is still in Washington D.C. Your uncle, and he's a part of your organization now. This nonviolent international. He's he's the one that founded the organization. He's okay. uh, he's stepping down from the board, uh, but yeah, he's the founder of whole okay. of nonviolence international. I have some friends that are PhDs that are working in the that are actually doing legit uh, research in this psychedelic healing of PTSD and stuff like that. I know they would love to connect Please. with you and hear more about what you're doing as well. And I would love to learn from them. So, it's a new field I'm in, so I would love to, yeah, 
any learning is available. I yeah. have to do that. And there's a there's a thing called ChristianPsychedelic.org um, that uh, a guy named well that John Hopkins did a, a research study with about a hundred pastors <laughs> and priests. You should have you should have been in that. Yeah, I know, I know, but I've met I've met the guys who have been in it. You yeah. know, so yeah, yeah. There, there's beautiful work done with spirituality, religion, psychedelics. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, amazing, amazing work taking place. I was in a conference last year in Colorado, actually in Denver. Uh, it was the biggest psychedelic conference in the world. 12,000 people, I think, were in it. And oh, my gosh. My Israeli partner spoke about the work that we're doing in it. Interesting. You, in you could Google it. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Okay, well, thank you, Sammy, so much for all the work you do for your family. Um, yeah. And I would really like to connect with your uh, cousin here in Kansas city. Who's running Nick's company now. Is he, would he want to yeah. meet? Do you think I could take uh, him uh, off or something? I don't know. We'll go to Oak park optical and uh, <laughs> him down. I'll knock on his, I'll knock on Elias. his door and say, Hey, <laughs> yeah. He'll, he'll probably remember you. Elias. Yeah. And okay. my brother is there as well. So you could always connect with uh, Samir, yeah. my brother. I'd like to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for tuning no in. To Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Honored. Really good to see you again. Yeah, you as well. God bless you. And Thank uh, you. thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Sorry. Hey, you made it to the end. Thanks for listening all the way through on this episode. By the way, if you're not already a supporter, go to spiritualityadventures.com, sign up for one of our monthly supports, and you will receive our bonus content. You'll receive lots of interesting information about our guests. Many of our musicians will do special bonus songs and record a song. So I want to encourage you to do that. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Be sure and subscribe. Be sure and share any of the episodes that you like. And be sure and make comments if you like them as well. This helps us uh, get spirituality adventures out there to more listeners, more, more watchers. So whatever platform you're using, subscribe, like, share, make comments. And go to our website, sign up for our team and be a part of the team support. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.